I distinguish two types of work. One is the weekend seminar, which is a kind of sampling, where you get acquainted with our approach. And those of you who want to work are welcome, and you see that you will learn a lot by participating. You're also free to interrupt and uh, make comments. Usually I do not answer questions because I don't believe there are answers. I believe we are always looking for the right question to the answer which is already given or beforehand. Which immediately leads us to what I believe are the two key words in Gestalt therapy. These two key words, if you understand them, I believe you have the whole story. The two key words are now and how. Two, three letter words. This sounds very simple. At the same time, I have to warn you, because to get to that spontaneity and authenticity, which we in our endeavor of bringing about possibly a humanistic revolution, we already have a certain amount of humanistic rebellion, but not yet a revolution. But to bring about that state, to save the genuineness of the human being, or let me talk in tried religious terms, to regain our soul, or to talk in American terms, to revive the American corpse and make him bring him back to life. Now the paradox is to get this spontaneity we need, just like in Zen, an utmost discipline. And the discipline is simply to understand, to break it off. Anything that is not contained in the words now and how. I know you are used to ask why like every child, like every immature person asks why, to get rationalizations or explanations. But the why, at best, leads to a clever, clever explanation, but not, never, to an understanding. So, let me say a few words more about the two words, now and how. The dogma is nothing exists except the now. The now is the present, is the phenomenon, is what you are aware of. It is that moment in which you carry your so-called memories, and your so-called anticipations with you. The past is not more, the past is past. And the past, what happened in the past, is either assimilated, it has become a part of us, or we carry around an unfinished situation. an incomplete gestalt. Let me give you as an example, the most famous of the unfinished situations is the fact that we have not forgiven our parents. <coughs> Especially if we are beset with the curse of perfectionism 
or idealism, then we discover our parents are never right, or in marriages, a husband or the wife is never right, because they don't measure up to this impossible yardstick of the ideal. The perfectionist in marriage, for instance, is not in love with his wife. He's in love with his ideal. And he demands from his wife that she should fit into this procrastus bed of this ideal. And she, he blames her if she does not fit. What this ideal exactly is, he would not reveal. Now and then there might be some characteristics, but the essence of the ideal is that it's impossible, it's unobtainable. Mm -hmm. Just a good opportunity to swing the whip. If you carry this ideal, this perfectionistic ideal around with yourself, you have a wonderful tool to play the beloved game of the neurotic, the self-torture game. There's no end of, to the self-torture, to the self-nagging, self-castigating. It hides under the mask of self-improvement. It never works. And you'll come across all the constellation, the how it cannot work. Now switching back to the now. Now I am pulling out of my drawer the memories and possibly believe that these memories are identical with our, my history. It's never true. We abstract certain experiences from the world and then file it away as memory. And if the memory then is unpleasant, especially if it's unpleasant to our self-esteem, we change it. And none of the so-called Freudian traumata has ever been proved to exist. <coughs> These traumata are always falsification or in most cases inventions. Uh, I suggest that you read a beautiful little pocketbook called I Never Promised You Rose Garden. We have got such an instance about this invented memory. Where the whole illness is supposed to be based on this memory. No wonder that all the wild goose chase of the psychoanalyst to find out why I am now like this can never come to an end can never prove a real opening up of the person it himself. Now the same applies to the future. It seems incredible that we should live without goals, <coughs> without worrying about the future that we could be open and ready for what might come. No, we have to take insurance policies. We have to make sure that we have no future, that the status quo should remain, or maybe even be a bit better. But we mustn't take risks. We mustn't be open that something should happen that would be new and exciting in contributing to our growth. So 
So much for the now, for the time being. Now the how is all we need to understand the way we or the world functions. The how gives us perspective, orientation. The how shows that the basic, one of the basic laws, the identity of structure and function <coughs> is valid. If we change the structure, the function changes. If we change the function, the structure changes. <coughs> the how gives perspective. The why gives only an unending inquiry in a cause, a cause of 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 a cause. And as Freud has already observed, every event is overdetermined, has many causes from all kinds of things. Sides come together in order to create the specific moment that is the now. Many factors come together to create this specific unique person which is I. Nobody can at any given moment be different from what he is at this moment, including all the wishes and prayers that he should be different. We are what we are. Now, the next objection is how do we bring about changes? Apparently there are lots of changes that are desirable. If you take one instance, this unpleasant habit of self-torture. The answer is changes occur by themselves once the different items are recognized and fall into their place. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. Any intention towards change will achieve the opposite. You know all this. The New Year's resolution. The desperation of being different. The attempt to control yourself. Or this always comes to naught on extreme cases when you're really apparently successful up to the point where the nervous breakdown occurs. The final way out. <coughs> Here again, once we recognize the structure of our behavior, which in the case of self-improvement is the split between a top dog and the underdog. And we understand how by listening we bring about a reconciliation of the two fighting clowns or tragic people. Then we realize that we cannot deliberately bring about changes in ourselves and in others. <coughs> the top dog underdog split works about like this. The character differ somewhat, but they have certain structures in common. The top dog usually is righteous, knows best. The top dog is a bully and works with you should and you should not. The top dog threatens. If you don't then, there will be catastrophes such as you won't be loved, you won't get to heaven, you will die and so on and so on, all the threats of the top dog. The underdog has no power. 
The underdog is the Mickey Mouse. The top dog is the Super Mouse. And the underdog works like this. Yeah. Manana. I try my best. Look, I try again and again. I can't help it if I fail. I can't help it if I forgot your birthday. I had such good intentions. Now you see the underdog. <coughs> the underdog is cunning. Both top dog and underdog strive for control. Like every parent and every child, they strive to meet each other for control. Now, again, the ways of manipulation of the top dog are very simple. Usually the top dog manipulates with threats and demands. The underdog manipulates with uh, being defensive, apologetic, wheedling, <coughs> playing the crybaby and such things. And we we'll come across a lot about if we come to talk about the means and ways how we manipulate each other how we manipulate ourselves in ourselves and the eternal struggle that there's only one purpose to keep the status quo of the neurosis intact. Maybe we have an opportunity here to see that one can get through the status quo, that you can get through the impasse that keeps the bad marriage bad and exhausting instead of satisfactory. That keeps the relationship of the therapist with the patient in the status quo going on for years and years. Again, the condition is, and this is the key, right now I can only hypnotize you, persuade you, make you believe that I'm right. <coughs> you don't know. I'm just preaching something. You wouldn't learn from my words. Learning is discovery. There's no other means of effective learning. You can a child, tell a child a thousand times, <coughs> stove is hot doesn't help. The child has to discover it for himself. And I hope I can assist you in learning, in discovering something about yourself. <coughs> Maybe I can also assist you in learning something more about the two worlds, the now and the how. I'd like to say a few words about the two levels on which we live. The usual idea we encounter is that we see the human being as one with a dichotomy between mind and body. Body and soul, or whatever dichotomy you choose. If this were true, we always all would be corpses inhabited, inhabited by a ghost. And uh, this ghost, then after death, can fly away to uh, heaven and the corpse is being burned. But in the meantime, whilst we are alive, uh, it's difficult to assume that such could be the split. We see every organism starting as a unit, the germ in a plant. And that this unit difference here, a unit difference here between opposites, yeah. right, left, up, down, and so on. So we are still left with a question, what then is this thing we call mind? The 
answer was first given by Freud. You see, Freud had devote, devoted his whole life to prove to himself and to others that sex is not bad. And he had to prove that, as in his time, the scientific approach was that of causality. That the trouble was caused by something in the past. Like a billiard cue pushing a billiard ball, and the cue is then the cause of the rolling of the ball. In the meantime, our scientific attitude has changed. We don't look to the world anymore in terms of cause and effect. We look upon the world as a continuous, ongoing process. We are back to Heraklai, to the pre socratian Pantarai. Everything is in a flux. We never step into the same river twice. In other words, we have made in science, but unfortunately not yet in psychiatry, the transition from one linear causality to thinking in process from the why to the how. <coughs> now, Freud, when he saw the one thing, what he called Denken is Probe Arbeit. Thinking is rehearsing. You see, if he had accepted the statement of his, thinking is rehearsing, he would have realized that our activity is turned towards the future. Because we rehearse for the future. Now, this is now the situation. We live on two levels. The public level, which is our doing, observable, verifiable, and the private stage, the thinking stage, <coughs> the rehearsing stage in which we prepare for future roles. We will plan for the roles we want to play. For the means whereby we have to organize in order to do what we want to do. Now it sounds a bit peculiar that I this is steam thinking in the way, making it just a part of role play. <laughs> However, when you look a bit deeper into your existence, our existence, my existence, you will realize that the pure biological being, the gratification of our instinct, sex, survival, breathing, plays only a minor part in our preoccupation, especially in a country where we are so spoiled, like in the States where we, even, we don't know what it means to be hungry. <coughs> where anyone who wants to have sex can have sex plenty of Anyone who wants to breathe can breathe. The air is tax free. Even the smog in Los Angeles is free. For the rest, we play games. We play games to quite an extent openly and to a much greater extent privately. 
When we think, we mostly talk to somebody. Sometimes we might communicate, most times we hypnotize. We hypnotize each other, we hypnotize ourselves that we are right. We play Madison Avenue to convince other people or ourselves of our value. And <coughs> this takes up so much of our energy again that sometimes if you are unsure about the role you're playing, you wouldn't dare to say a word, a sentence, without having it first again and again till it fits the occasion. Now, if you're not sure of the role you <coughs> want to play, and you're called away from your private stage to the public stage, then like every good actor, you experience stage fright. This stage fright is called anxiety. Anxiety is nothing but stage fright when your excitement is already mounting. You want to play a role, but you don't quite dare, so you hold back, you restrict your breathing, but the heart pumps up more blood because the higher metabolism has to be satisfied. And then once you are on stage and play the role, the excitement flows <coughs> into your performance. <coughs> If not, your performance would be rigid, called. It's very difficult for us to understand that we are always playing. So no wonder when we Try to understand the essence of a neurosis that on the first level we find what I call the Eric Burns or Sigmund Freud layer, the role playing layer. We behave as if we pretend to be better, tougher, more polite, and so then we really feel. And you see, when I spoke yesterday about manipulation, when the child has to play helpless, stupid, polite, flattering, the child, in doing so, develops the habit of using this type of manipulation. And habit is nothing but an performance of the same action that goes easier and easier. It's a grooving of one's activity that then becomes a habit, a character, a fixed role. 